As someone who grew up loving Commodore computers in the 1980s and the 1990s, I'm really excited to show you what's inside this see-through plastic bag. This is the A500 Mini. And it's a compact recreation or reimagining of the original Commodore Amiga 500 that came out in 1987. And as you would expect from a device like this, it uses emulation to play games. And the focus here really is on games. It comes with 25 classic Amiga games built in, but you can sideload thousands of additional Amiga games via WHD load. And this doesn't just support Amiga 500 games, it also supports Amiga 600 and Amiga 1200 games. So although the actual computer that's been recreated is A500, this can handle most Amiga games of the late 80s and early 90s. And as you can see in the box here, it also comes with a CD32S gamepad and a mouse as well. So it looks like a versatile little system here. Now there's no reference to Commodore on the box itself here, which I suspect is because of trademark issues. This was actually developed by a company called Retro Games and the company was very kind enough to send this out to me. So kudos to them. I really do appreciate companies that support my channel. Obviously it's not going to influence what I like and what I don't like about this, but Retro Games have already got a history of developing consoles like this. It's the same company that developed the recreations of the Commodore 64 and the VIC-20. So I'm quietly confident that this is going to be a cool little package. So what I'd like to do in this video is show you the box. I'd like to unbox it and I'd like to show you the system and the games and show you what you actually get when you buy the A500 Mini. It will be a long-ish video, so please check the video timeline in the description area. Feel free to jump to the area that's relevant to you. But without further ado, let's take a closer look at the A500 Mini. So the ugly plastic bag is off. I probably should have done that earlier. But before I do the unboxing, I want to show you the box itself because it does have a lot of useful information about the system. Now, like I said in the introduction, there's no reference to Commodore here, but it does say that it's the A500 Mini by Retro Games, and it does say Amiga Games. The system, the mouse, and the gamepad, you can see are all in classic Commodore beige, which is basically the color of all computers up to like the mid 1990s or late 1980s. And it has a 12 rating because one or more of the built-in games has a 12 rating. It also says that the, an AC adapter is not included. Can see there. Now that is really no surprise if you've got a mini NES, a mini Mega Drive, a mini SNES or any of these emulation mini consoles that have come out the last few years you'll know that they just come with a USB cable for power and they expect you to use your own USB charging adapter so that's to be expected but something to be aware of. Now this is being sold on Amazon for around £115 in the UK right now. It's $140 or so in North America. And if you buy it from Amazon, I'm sure it's going to come well packaged. But mine, this one here, was kind of sent just in a brown paper bag with no protection. So it's ripped all over the place. You can probably see that it's kind of ripped all at the seams here. I'm sure the console's okay, but I'm surprised they never packaged it better. Okay, so features. As I said, it does have support for emulating Amiga 500, 600, and 1200 games. It can output at a resolution of 720p, and it supports 50 and 60 hertz. It also has a CRT filter, and it does support many European languages, or this version does. And there's the box contents, which we'll take a look at soon, such as the two-button mouse and the eight-button gamepad. But as far as the games go, they say that it's classic Amiga games, and for the most part, I would agree with that. You know, when it comes to these mini games consoles, the game selection is a big reason as to why someone would or would not buy the system itself. But I do realize that it's quite difficult, you know, licensing-wise to pick games and which games to include. I think this looks like a good selection of games. And there's maybe about half of the games I've played myself and I've got a lot of love for. There's a lot of games that I, I'm aware of and I just never get around to playing. So personally, I mean, I grew up loving California games, Speedball 2, I played Arcade Pool, Kickoff 2, Another World, 
Worms, obviously Classic, and Zool, which is a very fast platformer, which I remember being marketed as being a Mario beater, which it wasn't, but it was a good game. So if you're like me, there's probably a lot of games here you're familiar with, a lot of games you've played before and love, but there's a lot of games here that you haven't played. And, you know, as you can see in the box here, it supports WHD Load, and that gives you access to so many additional games. So let's open this up and we'll see the A500 Mini. Okay, let's get this open. Wow, wow, look at this. Can't believe how tiny it is. This looks amazing. So really nice presentation here. There's kind of like plastic casing over the little console itself. And then we've got the A500. I mean, look at that. This thing is so tiny. Now, obviously, these you know these keys don't go down. It's not a real keyboard. It's superficial. It's just you know to kind of recreate what the original computer was like. But this thing is tiny. It's absolutely tiny. Also got a manual in here, and they've got the kind of classic Commodore style manual. This kind of binder style, which they used to have with all of their consoles. Looks really, really good. It's got color. This one's all in English. Yeah, looks like a fantastic little manual. We've got a quick guide there as well to help you get started. And then we have two boxes. So kind of obvious what's in these boxes, gamepad and mouse. Let's see what we've got here. Okay. It's gamepad, but it looks like they've thrown in the power cable here as well. And we've got the mouse. And the HDMI cable. So I've zoomed out to show you the whole A500 mini package. This is everything that you get in this box. So you've got your quick guide here to help you get started, and this is in a few different languages. But the user manual here is fantastic. I love this. They've recreated what you would get with a Commodore computer in the 1980s with the, the binder effect here. This one is all in English. It's 38 pages long, and it's all in color, and it's very easy to understand. So I think Retro Games have done a fantastic job here, and this is something that I will be referring back to. So I'll show you the A500 soon, because what I've got here is all the accessories and everything here is in classic Commodore beige. So we've got the Type A to Type C power cable, and it's 1.8 meters long. And the HDMI cable is 1.8 meters long too. And it's very thick, but I'm not sure what version it is. I don't imagine it's a late, you know, the latest version of HDMI because you know this only has an output resolution of 720p, but it does look like it's made very well. Now, I've removed the cable ties here, which is why the cables are kind of all over the place, but the cables look like they're all about 1.8 meters long as well. So this is the two-button mouse. It's optical. And this is the eight-button gamepad, which looks like they've just copied the CD32 gamepad. For those of you who know that boomerang style of gamepad. So yeah, that's got a cable, which seems to be about 1.8 meters as well. Now, another little thing here, which you can maybe see, is this. And I wasn't sure what that was. I just assumed it was an adapter, an adapter at first, but it's styled like a floppy drive. But if you plug this into your computer, you'll see that it's a four gigabyte flash drive. And it does come with a readme file or a few readme files, but that just says to go to the website to learn more and download WHD load. But this is a nice little addition. This will help you download additional games and connect them to your Amiga. 500 mini. With my other mini game consoles, I got two control pads included in the package. But here, Retro Games have opted to provide one game pad and one mouse. And I can see why they've done that, because you do require a mouse to get the complete and the true Amiga experience. I would say, though, I would have loved to have seen two game pads included in the package. I think it would have been a nice selling point, because it means that out of the box, you could have played Kickoff 2 or Speedball 2 with a friend. 
but you can pick up these separately, a second mouse, a second gamepad for it's like 20 pounds, 20 bucks each. So it's not a deal breaker. Now the mouse here is a recreation of the original tank mouse is what people called it. And feels really good in the hand. It's optical and yeah, feels good. The, the cable here is maybe a little bit thinner than the other USB cables, but yeah, I'm sure it'll be okay. The controller, I played the original CD32 controller. I played with it a few times at a friend's house and it, it's a little bit different. You know, it's different color. It's a little bit different in style, but it definitely has that kind of layout where you've got your four buttons here, kind of like a SNES, your left and right shoulder buttons and then menu and home, kind of select and start. So it's quite similar to a SNES controller, quite similar to the CD32 controller. Not played any of the games yet, but you know, in your hand, this does feel like a nice little controller. So this is the A500 Mini, and it really is mini. This is a small little device. My first impression is that it's light, but it's no surprise that it's light because it's really plasticky. Inside here is just a small printed circuit board. If they wanted to, they could have, you know, fit it inside something like this, like a Raspberry Pi kind of size but they've opted to recreate the original Amiga design. Now, I know from looking at comments online, some people would have preferred a larger device that had a working keyboard, but what they've done is made something smaller with a superficial keyboard, really. They're just trying to imitate what the original Amiga looked like. So all of these keys, they're superficial, they're just for display. And it's the same thing with the floppy drive at the side, but it does look quite cool. It, it really does look cool when you see it. Now, there's nothing on that side. You've got the fake floppy drive at that side. In the back here, I've got serial number 91. There's actually a screw under here, which I'll need to take off. I'll need to take a sticker off to get that screw to open it up. But the back here, we've got the power button. We've got the Type-C charging port. We've got an HDMI port, and then we've got three USB Type-A ports. And one will be your mouse, one will be your gamepad, and one could be another gamepad. But this does support the connection of other keyboards and other gamepads, etc. So it's quite flexible in that regard. But yeah, overall, I think it does look quite good. Might not be to everyone's taste, but I think they have faithfully recreated what the original Amiga 500 looked like. Just much, much smaller. So I've weighed the A500 Mini in at 320 grams, which is 11.3 ounces. But let's stay on the subject of size because I want to show you just how mini the A500 Mini is. So I'll show you some things that the A500 is actually bigger than. It's bigger than a Raspberry Pi 3B, which obviously can do very similar things emulation wise. It's longer than my smartphone, which is about the size of one of the larger iPhones. And it's bigger than the SNES Mini as well, at least from a length and breadth point of view. It's also bigger than the Genesis or Mega Drive Mini, like that. But it is worth noting that although it's kind of longer and wider than the SNES Mini, from a thickness point of view, it is a little bit thinner than those systems. And you can see that there against the SNES Mini and against the Mega Drive Mini. So as you saw there, the A500 Mini is a little bit longer and wider than the SNES Mini and the Mega Drive Mini. But don't be fooled, this is still a tiny system and it's super lightweight. And it's actually thinner than the SNES Mini and the Mega Drive Mini too. But I'd like to do some other size comparisons to really demonstrate how small this is. This is the Raspberry Pi 400. It's an all-in-one Raspberry Pi with a built-in functioning keyboard. But as you can see, the A500 Mini is like two thirds of the size. It's significantly smaller than a mini keyboard. In comparison to my Logitech K780, my wireless keyboard that I use with this PC, it's a similar story. This is about half the size of this keyboard and about two thirds of the QWERTY part of the keyboard. And again, if you get another full size keyboard, Maybe this will be useful for Apple users. This is an Apple full-size keyboard, and I mean, just look at the, the size difference. It's so much smaller than a regular keyboard. Now, growing up, I was not fortunate enough to have an Amiga. I always wanted one, but they were very expensive, but thankfully, many of my friends did. 
So I played so many Amiga games at friends' houses over the years. I love the system, I always wanted one. But what I did have was a Commodore 16 and then a Commodore 64. So whilst I can't do a comparison with the original A500, I can compare the A500 Mini to my clearly dusty and clearly needs a restore Commodore 64. I will restore this at one point in the future. But I mean, just look at the size of this in comparison and bear in mind the original Amiga 500 would have been much wider than this. It really was a big computer at the time. It was huge. And it becomes more apparent when you turn this on its side and you start doing this. I mean, just look at the difference in thickness. That is how technology has grown over the years. But like I was saying, this might not have the same kind of small uh, breadth and length of some mini classic consoles, but it's super light, it's super thin, and it really isn't going to take up a lot of room on your desktop. I touched upon the fact earlier that the A500 Mini has a printed circuit board inside, a PCB, and that's simply covered by this plastic shell, the casing, the recreation of the Amiga 500. But what I'd like to do at this point is open it up and actually show you what's inside. Now, this is not something that I recommend you do yourself. I'm doing it because I'm a YouTuber. They sent it out to me and I want to show those of you who are curious exactly what's inside. So the six screws here, one is exposed, it's a Phillips screw, but there's four other behind some feet and there's one behind this sticker. So the feet will be quite simple, but for this one, I'm gonna to have to lift up the sticker and then remove the screw. So I've managed to get the A500 Mini open. Taking the feet off, taking those screws out, very, very simple. Once you can apply this sticker off, you'll see the screw underneath and you can take that off as well. Now, when those screws are off and you start lifting it up, you'll probably notice that it starts sticking to this side because of there's a little connection there that connects to that to keep it in place. Now, I was scared that was glued on. I was scared I was going to break something, but if you just use a prying tool like this and just apply a little bit of pressure, just hold it there and just apply a little bit of pressure along the way, eventually it will come open and you shouldn't break anything. Not that you should be doing this anyway, but you should be okay if you've did this before and you've used prying tools. Now, at the back of the case here, you should be able to see that there's three weights and this is clearly to give some weight to the device because it's so light without it. Here we've got the back end of the fake keyboard. So you can see it there, like that. And this part here is connected to the main PCB. And if you look here, you can see this is for providing indicators, the power and drive indicator lights is connected there. Now there's still a few extra screws here. And if I take these off, we should be able to see the other side of the PCB. So this is the A500 Mini. This is the printed circuit board that handles everything. This is the computer. And you can see the three USB ports, HDMI, power connector, and the power switch, capacitor, and you can see a heat sink there. I've used these little heat sinks with Raspberry Pis and GPUs. And underneath there is apparently a Cortex A53. I saw someone saying it's the all winner H6 ARM processor. I'm not sure, but that's what I've seen online. Now, I did some Googling, if I can zoom down a little bit more. I did some Googling on these chips, but I couldn't see any results for them. But I also Googled this one. And when I put in this code here, TC58, it came up that this is a NAND flash two gigabyte chip. So this looks like it's a two gigabyte NAND flash drive. It's embedded obviously. And this is where all those built-in games and all the settings and all the magic is saved. So it's been interesting seeing what's actually inside the A500 Mini and seeing that the PCB really isn't that much bigger than what you would see in a Raspberry Pi. There's a lot of dead space here because they've wanted to recreate that Amiga experience and the floppy drive and the keyboard, it's all superficial.
But let's put it all back together and see what the A500 Mini can actually do. If you're one of the few people that did open up your Amiga 500 Mini, all you have to do to put it back together is secure the circuit board back to the front of the casing so that you can put the back casing back on. At which point you can use the provided screws to screw the back and the front case back together and then you can put those little rubber feet back on. Before you get everything connected up, I recommend checking the official website to see if any firmware updates are available. Because a firmware update may address some bugs or perhaps even introduce some new features. The first firmware update was just released and it does address a few bugs and it makes sure the WHD load is using the latest database. As you would expect from a system like this, getting set up is super easy. All you have to do is connect your gamepad, connect your mouse, connect the HDMI cable, and then connect the power cable and push the power button at the back of the system. Once the A500 Mini has powered on, you'll see an option to select your preferred language, and then you'll see an option to select 50Hz or 60Hz as your television setting. Now you can run some tests when you're doing this to see which one is better for you. I've tested both. I've been running 50Hz and 60Hz and I've tried lots of different games with these settings and to be honest, I can't notice a major difference with either setting, but play around with it, do some tests and see which one works for you and your monitor or your television. So here we are. This is the main dashboard for the A500 Mini. And it is overall a pleasant experience to navigate around and change settings. And you do that using the gamepad. You use the gamepad for everything here to go into games, to go out of games, to change settings. The mouse can only be used in game. Now, you can sort games in a number of different ways, such as alphabetical order or by favorites. And once you've selected the game and you're playing the game, you can go back to this main menu at any time simply by pushing the home button on the gamepad. The only thing that really annoyed me about the dashboard was the background music and that thankfully can be disabled. For each game you'll see the name, you'll see the description of the game and you'll see whether there is support for the mouse in game. It also shows you how many players can actually play the game and you can rate each game as well which helps you sort the game later. Each game also has a floppy disk icon which highlights whether you've played the game before and saved your progress. There's four game slots for each game on the system and you can go in at any point and play a game that you played weeks or months earlier and pick up where you left off. And it's very, very easy to do this. Whenever you come out of any game, you'll see the game state floating at the top right hand corner of the dashboard. And you just have to go in and then allocate this to one of the game slots. And you can then go back in at any point and play the game where you left it. If you push the menu button on the gamepad when you're in the main dashboard, you'll bring up the options panel. And there's a lot of useful configuration settings here. Under display options, you can change the zoom level for the game image. Now you can see here that I've selected screen fit because it eliminates borders. But if you prefer, you can select fixed size or moderate zoom. So there's a few different options there. You can also enable a CRT effect over the game image that simulates scan lines and you can enable image smoothing as well. Under system options, you'll see an option to control mouse sensitivity and you can change the volume of the background music in the main dashboard as well. And like I said, I'm not a fan of this myself, but you can adjust that as you please. There's also an option here to mimic the Amiga behavior for the power LED. If you wish, you can go back to language settings and change that around. And you can also go into advanced options and go back and change your television settings too. This page also has an option to use screen edges. So that's something that you might want to check out. And as you can see here, it says that this enables the option for your television to display a full 720p image without cropping. Other options here, well, we've got system information, tells you the build, we've got legal notices, We've got factory reset, which you may want to do if you want to reset things back to default settings. And the last advanced option is expert mode, which is a setting I do recommend activating if you're playing games via a USB flash drive, because it unlocks a lot of additional optimization options, which will help you get the most of games that were not built into the system. And finally, we have shutdown device, which like it suggests, 
will actually switch off the system. As you saw earlier, the A500 Mini does not have a real functioning keyboard. The keys on the system are simply there for display. Now a lot of Amiga games do require you to use a keyboard from time to time. Some games simply need you to enter your name, other games, well, you might have to type more depending on how you interact with the game. But what the developers have done to tackle this issue is to introduce a virtual keyboard. So when you're in a game, all you have to do is push the menu button and a virtual keyboard will slide from the right hand side and you get access to all Amiga keys. Now, if you're only going to be entering your name and interacting a little bit with the game, pushing return or entering a number, the virtual keyboard works really well. You just navigate around using your gamepad and it works great in practice. If you're playing a game that does require a lot of typing, I recommend connecting a USB keyboard instead of using the built-in virtual keyboard. You enjoy the game so much more. I connected up my Microsoft USB keyboard and I was able to use it to type in many different games. I had absolutely no issues. Now the only issue with doing that is that you've now run out of USB ports because you've got three USB ports and you're using it for your gamepad, your mouse and now your keyboard, which means that there's no USB port for a USB flash drive for other games. But it's very easy to solve that issue because you can connect a USB hub. And I connected up a USB hub and I was still able to connect the keyboard and type. So if you do have that issue, if you've used up all your USB ports, just be aware that you can use a cheap USB hub to connect up additional devices. As far as connections go, I don't think you're going to have any issues connecting to a USB hub, a USB mouse or a USB keyboard. I've not personally connected anything wirelessly to this little system, but I have been following the discussions about the A500 Mini and I have read that some people have connected keyboards and mice and controllers etc using a wireless PC dongle. My guess is that whether it works or not will depend on what you're connecting and how well that PC dongle connects to this little system, but give it a try. Now you can see there's a lot of cables here and there's a lot of controllers here and that's because I have been testing different controllers that I have about this room to see whether they work with the A500 Mini. Now officially they say that they have tested a small number of controllers, but I've not had a lot of success, if I'm honest, with the controllers that I've got around here. And I can show you that just now. So this is a PS4 controller that I've got and I'll plug this in. It's a wired connection and this actually works really well. Works very well. So I appear to have brought up the, the menu here. I think I pushed the button there actually in the, the menu button. So here we go. So I'm jumping about. It's responsive. Yeah, works great. Absolutely no issues. So the PS4, the PS4 controller here seems to work really well. I've got absolutely no issues connecting that and I don't suspect you will as well. And from what I've seen online, and I have been following discussions about this, it's the same story with the Xbox 360 controller. From what I've read, Xbox 360 controllers connect very well to the A500 Mini. With these controllers, with the Xbox controllers here, I've not had such luck. So this is the Xbox Series X controller, which is still kind of synced to my Xbox Series X, but I tried to connect this just by plugging in. It won't work. And I've read a lot of discussions about this and no one else has had success with this. This is the Xbox One controller that I've got. And it's the, the one that came you know, kind of sold as one for your PC. And I thought this would work because this isn't synced to any system. There's, you know, there's no issues like that there, but it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And I've, I've tried to get it working and I can't get it working at all. And I've seen a lot of other people say the same thing about this controller that they just can't get it work. So as far as Xbox goes, the older Xbox 360 controllers apparently work quite well with this. Xbox One, Xbox uh, Series X here, sorry these ones don't seem to work too well. I've got the Nintendo Switch Pro controller here as well, and was the end of this, I've got too many cables here. The Nintendo Switch Pro controller is something that I thought would work. I thought I'd be quite successful plugging this in and, and just getting it to work, but I'm still getting issues where it's, it's trying to find it. I think it's still trying to find my Nintendo Switch, so maybe if I disconnect it from my Nintendo Switch, 
I was hoping that just by connecting it wirelessly it would work, but yeah, it, it's not being recognized at all here. So that's a little bit annoying, but that's something that I was hoping would work. So from my own controllers, I've got my PS4 controller working. It's plug and play, it does work. I've tried some other controllers, I didn't have any luck. 8-bit Doe controllers apparently work really well, but you know, from my experience and from looking at discussions online, this is an area where the developers really need to kind of improve the support for controllers. I'd ideally like to just connect an Xbox controller, connect a Nintendo controller and just have it work. Hopefully in a future firmware update, we'll get better support for a host of different game controllers. I think that would be a great addition, especially because some control, uh, some games, sorry, you know, Sensible Soccer, other football games, and a lot of other games on the Amiga, they work better with joysticks, or they work better with these styles of game controllers. Let's take a look at the 25 games that come packaged with the A500 Mini. The first game is called Alien Breed 3D. It's an early attempt at a 3D first-person shooter, but it really hasn't aged too well. And there's a few reasons for that. One is that you've got a 4-3 aspect ratio, but the game doesn't even populate the full screen. It's a box inside a box. It's quite dark as well, so it's quite hard to see what you're doing, and the controls feel a little clunky. It's just not a great experience, and there really isn't a lot to come back for. Sticking with the Alien Breed franchise, we have Alien Breed Special Edition 92. This is a top-down style maze game, which feels a lot like the classic game Gauntlet. There's lots of aliens to fight, and you have to accumulate keys in order to open doors, and you can get money along the way to upgrade your guns, buy key packs, and buy other things. Overall, I had a lot of fun with this game, and it's a game I will come back and play. Next up is the cinematic action-adventure game Another World. It initially came out on the Amiga and the Atari ST, but it has since been ported to dozens of different game platforms. I absolutely loved this game growing up, and I still think the graphics look amazing, and the game still feels immersive. Without doubt, Another World is a challenging game. You will die a lot, because every single thing in this game kills you. But it is enjoyable. You just have to make sure that you take a note of the Axis code, so that you don't have to repeat those same sections again. Arcade Pool is a fun little pool game that offers many different game modes. You use the mouse to play this game, and in comparison to other snooker and pool games that came out on the Amiga, I found it a little bit difficult to control the ball. You just don't have as much control over the way that you're shooting, but it's still a lot of fun to play, and it's always satisfying when one of your shots go in. When I first loaded up Arcade Pool, I probably played it for about an hour because I was finding it hard to pot, and I was finding it hard to win a game. But once you get hang of the controls, you'll start potting and you'll start beating the computer. ATR All Terrain Racing is a top-down off-road style racing game. Before each race, you can buy a number of upgrades for your car in order to improve performance. And during the race, you can collect money and collect power-ups. All-terrain racing can be a little bit challenging at first because the controls are a little bit tricky and it takes a while to learn the layout of each map. And it doesn't help that there's so many obstacles in the map that set you back and set you back from first place to fourth place. But once you get used to the controls and once you learn how the maps are laid out, you'll soon find yourself challenging other players for the title. Battle Chess is a 3D chess game which you play with the mouse. It's easy to play, the graphics look okay, and it's got some fun animations, and there's some configuration settings there to allow you to change how you play the game. I enjoy chess, but I did not enjoy this game. And the reason is that I found this whole game to be painfully, painfully slow. I do appreciate that chess is a game that is sometimes played slowly, but I just found it annoying to wait on those animations every single move. Kadava is an isometric adventure game where you explore a castle and you tackle lots of puzzles, collect
collect items and interact with levers, doors and different objects. I've only played this game a short while and once I got used to the controls I was starting to enjoy the game. And generally speaking, castle exploration games can be quite challenging but they can also be quite rewarding. So if you're willing to put the time into this game, I think you'll have a lot of fun. The classic outdoor sports game California Games has also been included with the A500 Mini. Several events are available to play. This includes skateboarding, rollerblading, footbag, surfing and BMXing. California Games is not a game that you'll load up and win right away. In fact, when you first play it, you will fail miserably at each event. So the real challenge comes from practicing each event and mastering them. Next up is the Chaos Engine, and this is a game I had a lot of fun with. It's a top-down running gun style shooting game where you can choose from one of six different characters. There's four different landscapes to navigate and you can run around shooting bad guys, collecting power-ups, collecting money and keys and solving puzzles. There's a lot to enjoy here and this is a game I'm definitely going to be going back to. Dragon's Breath is a fantasy strategy game which you play with the mouse. You control one of three dragon lords and you incubate eggs to raise dragons. You conquer towns, you raid villages and you impose taxes to increase your wealth. My first impression of this game is that it's okay, but not too exciting. But I really haven't spent enough time with the game yet to say with conviction whether it's a good or a bad game. When Dragon's Breath was first released in 1990, it got fantastic reviews and a lot of people still remember it as being a great game. So you might have to spend a lot of time with this game to really get into it and really appreciate what the game offers. F-16 Combat Pilot is a combat flight simulator which you play with your mouse. The aim of the game is to use your cannon, missiles and tactical systems to win dogfights. Now, this game does look like it's a lot of fun, but I have been terrible at it so far and I was delighted just to get the plane off the ground. Kickoff 2 was a hugely popular football game in the early 90s and it was available on many different platforms. It's fast, there's lots of game modes and it's a lot of fun to play. The A500 gamepad is not the best way to play football games such as Kickoff 2 or Sensible Soccer. You'd be much better picking up a retro style joystick or using a modern controller that has a good thumbstick. But regardless, you'll still have a lot of fun with Kickoff 2. The Lost Patrol is a strategic role playing game which you play with the mouse. The aim of the game is to find the survivors of a US military helicopter that crashed during the war in Vietnam. And in order to do that, you have to learn what your team is like and manage them effectively. The game got solid reviews when it was initially released in 1990, but so far I've struggled to get into this one. It's okay, it's just not that exciting, and it just doesn't feel like this game has aged as well as other strategy games from that time. Paradroid 90 is a top-down arcade shooter where you have to go into each room and clear all the robots. I found this game to be quite boring after a while. The graphics are kind of bland, there's not much happening with the game audio and the gameplay itself gets quite repetitive quite quickly. Pinball Dreams is a fun pinball simulation game which offers four different pinball machine tables. The A500 gamepad works fantastically with this game as the left and right shoulder buttons act like pinball machine flippers. The game simulates a real pinball machine incredibly well. So you can tilt and roll over and there's traps and there's tunnels and there's jackpots. I love the mechanics of the game. I love how easy it is to pick up and play. And I love the game audio and all the silly features and tunnels, etc. It's one of the games I'm going to keep going back to whenever I load up the A500 Mini. Another game I had a lot of fun playing was Project X Special Edition 93. 
This is a great little horizontal shooter where you collect power-ups to buy different weapons for your spaceship. It's a lot of fun and a welcome addition to the system. Select now for power up. Quack is a fun little cartoon puzzle platformer where you have to find keys to exit through the door and get to the next stage. You can throw eggs at enemies to kill them and there's potions available to allow you to levitate, improve your armour, inflict double damage, go invincible and more. I had a lot of fun playing through Guac and I love the fact that not only is it a two player game but a second player can join in the fun at any time. The Sentinel is a 3D puzzle game in which you use your mouse to control a telepathic robot. The goal of the game is to reach the top of the valley and absorb the sentinel, but you have to avoid the sentinel's gaze and you have to avoid sentries and other obstacles as well. I fully appreciate that this game was groundbreaking when it first came out in 1986, but I don't think it's aged too well. I still think the graphics look okay, but the controls are a little bit cumbersome and there just isn't enough there to keep you entertained. Simon the Sorcerer is a funny point and click mouse adventure game that plays in a similar way to games such as The Secret of Monkey Island. These funny adventure games were very popular in the early 1990s and Simon the Sorcerer got very good reviews at that time, so I think it's a nice addition to the system. Speedball 2 Brutal Deluxe was one of my favourite games growing up. It's a brutal sports game set in the future where you run around very quickly throwing the ball at each other and trying to get that ball into the net. It's fast and it's violent and you can punch anyone who gets in your way. The game has knockout league and cup matches and you can buy and sell players to improve your team. And during the game you can pick up armour and weapons to improve your chance of winning. I have spoke a lot about certain Amiga games not ageing well but in my opinion, Speedball 2 is just as enjoyable as it was in the 1990s. Stunt Car Racer is an early attempt at a 3D driving game. You can choose from one of 12 players and there's 8 tracks to play. And in each track, you need to jump over barriers and use your limited turbos to try and get past the competition. I loved the idea of this game, but I did not really enjoy the game itself. Firstly, because of the controls, they just didn't work too well. And secondly, because of the poor camera angles that made it really difficult to see what was going on. Like all terrain racing, Supercars 2 is a top down racing game where you try and win each race in order to win the championship. During the race, you can use missiles, mines, turbos and armour to gain an advantage over other drivers. Whilst all of that sounds good on paper, I just did not enjoy Supercars 2. The graphics look dated, the audio is really bad and the controls are quite clunky as well. Titus the Fox is a cartoon side-scrolling platform game where you need to go through 15 levels in order to save Susie who has been kidnapped. You'll face a lot of enemies during the game. One option is to pick up objects and throw them at them, but you will find yourself jumping over enemies or simply running away from them. The game is incredibly fast, so it feels kind of frantic at times, but I did find myself really enjoying the game. Worms, the director's cut, is a fun turn-based action strategy game that allows you and the computer, or you and a friend, to fight each other with 40 different weapons. There's many different map types to choose from and the game remains as crazy and as fun as it was all those years ago. My friends and I must have played Worms on the Amiga for thousands of hours, so it's great to see the director's cut of this game included with the A500 Mini. The last built-in game for the A500 Mini is Zool, and this colourful action scrolling platformer does not hide the fact that it's one big advertisement for the lollipop chupa chups. 
Zool does not stand up well next to a Sonic game or a Mario game. But it's important to remember that the Amiga was not blessed with many good platformers. And this was quite a good little game. And I think it still is quite a fun little game. It's a bit fast, it's a bit frantic, the controls are not great, but it's still fun to play. I've spent many hours playing the 25 built-in games that come packaged with the E500 Mini. And overall, it's kind of a mixed bag. There's some games that are just okay, and there's other games that are, quite frankly, quite poor. They just haven't aged that well. But there's a lot of quality games there as well, and these games are still a lot of fun to play. Games such as Another World, Worms, Pingball Dreams, Chaos Engine, Project X, and Speedball 2. These are games that I will come back to time and time again. Retro Games also offers a bonus game called Citadel. This game can be downloaded from the Retro Games website, and all you have to do is download the file, extract it to your USB flash drive, and then load it on the system using WHD Load. Citadel is a 3D first person shooter, and like Alien Breed, because of the limitations of the Amiga, we have the main gameplay in a box in the middle of the screen. In comparison to Alien Breed, the graphics in Citadel are a little better and the gameplay is a little better as well. But this isn't a standout game per se, it's not an amazing game, but what it is is a good tutorial which shows you how you can download games to your flash drive, load them to your A500 Mini and then play them using WHD Load. You may have noticed that the Citadel game image has not been cropped correctly so far. It's a bit squashed and there's a large black border around the game. Now this is something that you will experience when you load up many Amiga games using WHD Load. You may recall from earlier in this video that there's an expert mode available under advanced options. But as you can see here, no such option is available just now. And that's because I haven't yet connected my USB flash drive with games in WHD Load. But if I connect the flash drive now, go out and go back in, expert mode is available. But I'm going to leave that disabled for a second because what I want to do is show you WHD load itself. So my USB flash drive is connected and I have a lot of games and I've got them stored here at the top level here under games. And I've got a lot of games here, but I want to show you Citadel. And if I select the game using A, I can then access the game settings using menu. And you'll see a number of different options here, but one of the most important ones is crop width and crop height. And like I said, a lot of games just won't look right. So you need to mess about with this. You need to increase, you need to decrease, you need to get the vertical offset right. And this will help you get the game looking correct. Auto Center, NTSC. There's a lot of useful game options here. And you can see that you can also choose to use mouse, joystick, or CD32 pad. And you can also map the game pads as well, which is obviously useful if you're using a third party controller. Mouse speed can be configured here as well. Now, if I go back and I go back to the menu and I select expert mode and I go back to the same screen, game settings, you'll see that I now have additional options for interlaced. I've got blitter mode, and I've got memory optimized. And this allows you to decrease or increase the amount of memory which has been allocated to the game. Once you've adjusted your crop settings, you can go back into your game and then see how your game image now looks. Now you might have to repeat this process several times, depending on how you've adjusted your settings, but you don't have to lose your progress when you do this because you can save your game at the top right hand side and just have it floating there Go in and change your settings and then simply bounce back to the game. One of my favourite things about the A500 Mini is that it was designed from the ground up to support the whole Amiga library. That's thousands upon thousands of games. The system has native support for WHD load and a 4GB flash drive is included in the package. So you have everything you need to get started. It's super easy to add new Amiga games to your flash drive. All you have to do is copy the file over to the drive. The only thing to bear in mind is that you shouldn't extract the game file. Make sure it retains that IHA file format. 
I initially stored games deep inside the E500 directory, but it doesn't seem to matter where you store games. I tried several different file structures and it doesn't seem to matter to WHD load where you actually store your games. All it does is change how you access the games, as in which paths you have to follow whilst you're using the A500 Mini. So what I did was create a directory called games and put it at the top level, just to make it a little bit quicker and a little bit easier to access games. At this point, I've been using the A500 Mini and playing games on the system for over a month. And one of the reasons why it's taken me so long to get this review out is that I was experiencing many problems when playing games using WHD Load. A lot of games just simply weren't working. So this was an issue that obviously every A500 Mini user was experiencing. So I was following the discussions about this and I was following the community made spreadsheet which was showing which games were working and which games were not. Unfortunately, Retro Games did not release a firmware update within the first four weeks of the console's life. So what many people recommended was manually updating WHD load yourself. And doing this did address most of the issues that you were experiencing. So it is something that people were doing. Thankfully, this is not something you're going to have to do yourself because Retro Games have just released the first official firmware update for the system. And it does update WHD load and it does address an issue with black screens being displayed too. You may still run into some issues with certain games, but that is common with game emulation. So if you run into any problems with a particular game, download a different variation of that game, a different emulated zip file, download it from a different source, and check the spreadsheet to see if there's any common issues with that particular game. With the latest firmware update, WHD Load is working fantastically. I think of all the games I've downloaded, I only have an issue with one game now, and I think it's an issue with the game itself rather than WHD Load. The only thing you need to remember to do is to crop the game image correctly and you can normally do this using the auto crop option when you're cropping the width and height. So here I am over a month after unboxing the E500 Mini and over the last month I've played a lot of games on this system, I've had a lot of fun, I've tested many different things and at this point I have a good idea as to what I like and what I don't like. Now, I'm going to clarify exactly what I think about this, but if you just want a quick summary, I would say that if you grew up around the same time I did, if you grew up owning an, an Amiga computer or just playing Amiga at friends' houses, I think you're going to love this system. It brings back a lot of nostalgia. There's a lot of classic games you can play, and I think the overall package is fantastic. Now, if you're a little bit younger and you didn't grow up around the Amiga, but you love retro games, Maybe try some Amiga games on your laptop computer first. See if you like some games, and if you do, then you might want to pick this up. But I do think that overall, this is a fantastic package. And on the subject of the package, well, firstly, I just love the look of this console. I mean, it looks like the classic Amiga 500. It just looks amazing. Yes, this is a case. Yes, it could have been smaller, but I think it looks great, even if all of this is kind of superficial. The overall package is great though, I mean, you get the gamepad, the console itself, you get the mouse, you get this classic manual, you get the HDMI cable, the power cable, and you get a little flash drive that looks like a floppy drive as well. But of course, you don't need to use floppies to play games on this system. The only thing I would say is, from a controller point of view, I would have loved to have seen a second gamepad, just because there's so many classic Amiga games that are two-player. And I also think it would have been great to have an option to buy this console with a joystick. Now, if you're my age or around this age, you'll, pro you'll probably remember that most people didn't play games on the Amiga using a gamepad. They played using a joystick. And you can pick up joysticks for this system, but yeah, I think a joystick would have been great for games like Kickoff, Sensible Soccer, Speedball 2, and other sports games. But I'm kind of nitpicking here because I think the package overall is really good. The only thing that kind of annoys me is all of this, all of these cables. It can be a little bit of a mess. And I realize this is something that other systems struggle with as well, but I guess it would have been a good option to have a Bluetooth gamepad or a Bluetooth mouse just to kind of reduce the number of cables that are there. Like I noted earlier, I've not tried this myself, but a lot of people have said that they've used Bluetooth dongles and they have connected game controllers. So, you know, going wireless as an option. 
Game controllers, you know, I had some success with the PlayStation 4 controller. I just plugged it in, it worked. I didn't have so much luck with the Xbox and Nintendo Switch, but I'm hopeful that this will be addressed. Hopefully in the future, you know, with a firmware update, we'll get support for these other controllers and we'll have a better selection of controllers to choose from. You know, there are some options out there from 8-Bit Do and other game controller companies that will work right out of the box, but it would be good to see better support for, for different controllers that you can play with this system. Now, as far as the system itself, I really do like the interface. I think it's very easy to navigate. I didn't have any problems with it. And I think the 25 built-in games work really well. They've obviously been chosen or they've been optimized after being chosen for this console. They're very fast to load. And I love the fact that you can save games, multiple games. I think, you know, the whole thing works really well. So in that regard, you know, very happy. As far as the quality of those built-in games, I think if you to look at the game selection for the A500 Mini and compare it to those included in a system such as the Mega Drive Mini or the SNES Mini, I don't think the game collection here stands up as well. I think there's several games here included in the package which are classics. They were classics years ago and they still are a lot of fun to play. But there's a lot of games that are just okay and there's quite a few games that are just really poor. You just won't play them either because they always sucked or maybe because they just didn't age too well. But that is not a real major criticism of this console because this was designed to play any Amiga game. It comes with WHD load already on the system. It comes with a flash drive for you to download your games. You don't even have to go out and buy another drive unless you want to store more games. It is designed to play every Amiga game out there. And the latest firmware update addresses some of the bugs that I had a few weeks ago. And, you know, this gives you access to thousands upon thousands of Amiga games. Maybe not all of them are classics, but it does give you access to that whole library. And that's just amazing. There's so many amazing games I didn't play back in the day. And this simplifies the process of doing that. And it simplifies the process of playing with a gamepad and with a mouse. It's just a very nice setup to use. I guess the only downside to it is that for every single one of those games that you play through WHD Load, you currently have to go in and crop the game image to the right height using auto crop or manually adjusting the, the image. Hopefully there'll be a firmware update in the future where we can just do an auto setting so that it maximizes the game image for all of those games. Now, obviously there'll be some of you watching this thinking, why not just buy a Raspberry Pi? And I think that is a valid question because these are arguably more versatile, whereas this is only designed to play Amiga games. You know, this retails right now over a hundred odd bucks, and I think it's a good overall package. And the reason being that, you know, right now you can get like a Raspberry Pi 4, get one of the models like a kit for like 65, 70 pounds, but you don't get the, the game controllers and you still have to go out and then, you know, install the, the software, etc. Here, you've got everything working out of the box. You've got your Amiga emulation system, and you've got the gamepad, you've got the mouse, and you've got everything set up, ready to go. And you've got a little Amiga, which is quite cool to look at. So overall, I think it's a great little package. I appreciate it's not for everyone, and some people might want to go with the Raspberry Pi so that they can play other systems. But I think that if, if you're looking for some nostalgia, if you grew up, playing the Amiga, if you grew up always wanting an Amiga, then I think this is very easy to recommend. I hope you've enjoyed this video. This has admittedly been a very long video because I wanted to cover things for those of you who are curious in buying. But I hope you have a better understanding now as to what this offers, what it doesn't offer. And I'm hopeful that in the future, some of the things that do annoy me right now, you know, just the way some things are set up, hopefully those will be improved in a future update. But until next time, thanks for watching. Please do leave a comment below and take care.